Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, so it's time once again for my yearly Thanksgiving Day special. Today's episode is featuring some fairly traditional red wines along with their white counterparts that we don't typically see. As you can see, I'm doing four wines versus my usual three for a special. I'm super excited to review these wines. Three of the four wines were given to me for review by local distributors. Only one, the explicit content that I explicitly asked for. So the so among the traditional wines of Thanksgiving, Beaujolais is probably one of my favorites when it comes to wines. I also enjoy a good Chateau of the Pop. Mention these wines to people, especially in association with the holidays and 99 out of 100 people will instantly think red. There's always going to be that one person who's a contrarian, a contrarian that won't, but basically everyone thinks red for Beaujolais and Chateau So let's get into some background about these wines. The first two wines are from the same producer out of Beaujolais, Domaine J. Boulon. The estate dates back to at least 1850 when Joseph Gachot buys the property. He plants vines among the meadows and fields, as the website says. The English version of the site is fine, but it's a bit clunky. I ran the French version through Google Translate to get a little bit better version for myself. Anyway, at some point, Jean Boulon, I think I'm going to say Bouillon, but it's only one L. So it's probably Boulon. Uh, anyway, he buys the property. Not sure exactly when, but early enough for there to be a Louis Boulon, followed by a Joseph Boulon to continue. At this point, we are at the third of six generations of owners of the property. In 1973, Joseph decides to bottle some of the wine to show off the quality of his grapes. Friends and family receive the wine, uh, receive the wine well, and word spreads among their friends. This begins their bottling of wines directly to consumers rather than into distribution, from what I can tell. In 1978, Jacques and Francois get married. I'm going to assume the Jacques is Joseph's son. Uh, they had six hectares under a vine at the time. Uh, over the next 30 years, they continue to promote their wines. They also acquire more land and vines. In addition, they update their winery in 1986 with new equipment and their production grows to about 100,000 bottles, still direct to consumer. In 2005, Ludovine and Hugo Boulon arrive. I don't know what that means necessarily. I think they are brother and sister, and the use of the word arrive signals them taking over the operation of the winery. At this point, they have 27 hectares of vineyards, 6 hectares of Morgan, 11 of Beaujolais, just in general, 1 of, uh, one of Moulin Avant, it's funny because my script says windmill, I don't know how that happened, and 9 uh, hectares of just Chardonnay in Beaujolais. They also start exporting their wines during this time. I have had the Morgan wine and thought it was spectacular. Especially for being like under 20 bucks, it's getting harder to find Cru Beaujolais for under $20, but they are making it. For these wines, I have the Beaujolais Blanc and their Moulin Avant. The white was given to me some time ago uh, by, the, by the distributor. Not necessarily for review, but I, I held on to it knowing I'd review it at some point. I bought the Moulin Avant. All right, let's get the stats for these wines. The 2020 J. Boulon Beaujolais Blanc. It retails for around $15 to $18. Is a Beaujolais Blanc. It's 100% Chardonnay. No other grapes are allowed for this appellation. Burgundy does allow Pinot Blanc and Pinot Gris along with their along with other grapes based on appellation as far as like Chardonnay, but they're effectively 100% Chard. They're hand harvested. It's whole cluster, gentle pressed. Stainless steel aging. Its cellaring is no longer than three to four years, and the ABV is 13%. For the red, the 2018 J. Boulon, Moulin Avant, it's a Beaujolais, and it's uh, the suggested retail price, you can get it for around 18 to 20 bucks. It's a Cru Beaujolais, uh, which means it's a named village. The village is Moulin Avant. It's 100% Gamay, it's hand harvested, 
whole cluster, gentle pressed, aging one year in oak, presumably French, but no indication of how much is new versus used. Cellaring is seven to 12 months, depending on vintage. The ABV is 14.1%. So real quick about Moulin Avant, it is the windmill of Moulin. So Moulin is the, is the town and, uh, I'm sorry, Moulin Avant is the mill. Moulin is mill and Avant is wind. So, and there is a windmill there. Hopefully I'm showing you a picture of the windmill when I visited uh, way back in 2017. All right, next up we have a white Chateau Neuf de Pop, AKA, AKA CDP in the industry. The producer of this one is Paul Autard. I've had other wine from this winery and they've all been excellent. So I expect no less with this one. White CDP is kind of a rare wine. Now that depends on your definition of rare, but only about 7% of CDP is white. While there are 18 total grapes, both red and white, that, red and white that are allowed for CDP red, only the white grapes are allowed. No, I'm not gonna rattle off all 18, but I probably just threw up a graphic with all the grapes. And there are only six white grapes on the list. Those white grapes are Bourbon Blanc, Claret, Grenache Blanc, Picardon, Pic Pool Blanc, and Roussan. Okay, so what about Paul Altard? The estate was founded in 1970 by Paul in the town of Cortezon. It kind of sounds like courtesan, though I'm pretty certain there's no relation to the words. I, I kind of checked. Anyway, his son Jean-Paul took over the operation at the young age of 17 when his father passed away unexpectedly. I couldn't find out what year that happened though. Jean-Paul's daughter, Pauline, also works with him. The estate has 26 hectares of vineyards. 12 hectares are in the Chateau Neuf de Pop. 14 in the Côtes du Rhône region. Apparently, these vineyards border the Chateau Neuf de Pop appellation in Cortezon. These vineyards are planted in a variety of soil types, galets roulés, limestone pebbles, and clay and sandy clay. Grapes are destemmed and fermented separately in stainless steel tanks using native yeasts. They are then transferred to oak barriques for aging. They use a combination of new and used barrels for aging and different wines are made up of different combinations of these barriques. For this wine, it's hard to find info, but I did find info that find out info for the 2015 vintage. So some of that will be in the stats coming up. All right, the importer's website says that they use what is known as culture raisonné. I've never seen this, I've never seen this term exactly, but I suspect they are referring to lute raisonné. If you watch my farming practices videos from last year, you may have seen me talk about this in the sustainable farming episode. The term lute raisonné is very casually used by many people, but most don't realize that it was actually legally defined in France. In 2013, this changed to haute valeur environmentale, environmentale uh, or HVE. In English, it's high environmental value or HEV. These do have a certification body, so while someone may use the term lute raisonné or sustainable farming on their website, unless they are certified, you won't see the HVE logo on a bottle. Is this a big deal? Well, yes and no, I don't know. For many, especially in Europe, there isn't a desire to go through the hassle of getting a certification, even for sustainable farming, even more for those who that typically stick to organic or even bio. They may have a small operation and the yearly cost of certification isn't worth it. In this case, the importer's website states that he only uses organic fertilizers and no pesticides or uses chemical anti-rot, I'm sorry, doesn't use anti-rot products. I'm not sure exactly what that means. I'm assuming uh, that last part refers to fungicides. The vines average 50 years of age with the oldest nearing 100 years old. This ensures low yields, which typically means higher quality. A lot of prevention of issues that the group of sides help prevent is done by hand in the vineyards, such as the removal in May and June of unessential shoots and leaves that would block the proper aeration of the vines. The bottom line is that Jean-Paul is using a mostly organic approach to farming without any certification. This also allows him to choose to use synthetics if necessary. I didn't get, I didn't, I didn't get this last part from my website. I'm just saying that he has options if he so chooses. Understand, I'm not saying he actually uses synthetics. Just that if he can, if he wants to, but he probably doesn't. Okay, so enough of that. Here are the stats for the wine. The 2019 Domaine Paul Autard Chateau Neuf de Pop Blanc uh, for $54. It's from Chateau Neuf de Pop. The varieties used are 34% Grenache Blanc, 33% Claret, 33% Roussan. Other grapes are distemmed, 
It is stainless steel fermentation. Aging is 100% new oak barrels for 10 months. Now this is from the 2015 text sheet. Presumably French, but the text sheet didn't specify. And that was it. Okay, so the final line, full disclosure, I personally know the person responsible for this wine, and I've had a different wine from him in the past that was excellent. He is not the winemaker per se, but he is involved in the entire process. So I already have a potential positive bias for this wine. This wine was also provided for free from the local distributor. All right, so explicit content from the mind of Jeremy Hart. This is a collaboration with Chateauneuf de la Font du Loup. In English, the castle of the fountain of the wolves. How cool is that? Jeremy has told me that he has more coming next year under this label, a Bordeaux Red, Oregon Pinot Noir, Mosul Riesling, and an Alta Adige Pinot Bianco. I am looking forward to checking them out. Maybe I can get an interview with him. He'd be really cool to have on the show. Jeremy, get on the show. He doesn't know I added this part. That He doesn't know I, I said this in here. Anyway, he, he's going to see for the first time when, when uh, he sees it. Anyway, from the back label, Explicit Content is a collaboration project with wineries in the best regions of the world. The idea is simple. Partner with my favorite producers to create wines that are perfect examples of the region's sense of place. Purity of fruit wines that are not manipulated, heavy or oaked out, unedited, as the artist intended. Punk rock AF. I'm sure you can figure out what the AF is. Anyway, so we now have the premise for this wine. What's cool is that we also know who the winery is. Many of these kinds of wines are known as DIs or direct imports, also called private labels. Most of the time, these are wines made to fit a restaurant or retail program at a target price, often at a more value price point. When it comes to CDP, value isn't usually what comes to mind, and that's not what's happening here. In this case, Jeremy is doing a true, transparent collaboration with a winery making the kind of wine he wants, and hopefully we do too. Otherwise, he's going to have a lot. He's going to have to have a massive party at his place. Hey, man, I'm down for that, brother. All right. Anyway, he, he lives he lives not far from, well, he doesn't live in San Antonio, but he lives in Texas. Anyway, let's get the story of Chateau de la Font de Loup, because it's kind of punk rock AF. Okay, maybe not to that extreme, but it is kind of cool, but short. The castle was built next to a spring, as the name implies. When? They don't say. Legend has it that the wolves of Mont Ventoux, after descending into the plain, came to drink there. That is kind of cool, I must say. As the website says, a castle must have a princess, and that princess is Anne Charlotte Melia Bacchus. While she may not truly be royalty, she is the fourth generation winemaker for the winery. Their winemakers are a bit unusual for the area, being mostly sand rather than the most common Galais Roulets. The sandy soil allows excellent drainage. Galais Roulets also do that. The spring next to the chateau also provides natural irrigation to the surrounding soil. To be clear, they don't actually irrigate the vineyards as far as I know, because well, that's illegal in the EU, just that the spring provides a, a natural water source for the surrounding land. The vineyard is a total of 20 hectares, all of it as one plot of land rather than multiple smaller plots. They are HVE level three certified. Additionally, they incorporate bees, which provide honey and sheep to aid with fertilization. They've been farming organically since the spring of 2021. I'm assuming they'll attain that certification in the next few years. They make a variety of CDPs, including a white. They also have a Cote du Rhone red, white, and rosé. The grapes from those appear to come from the same vineyards, or at least vineyards very close by. This wine appears to be similar to the Chateau's Les Demoiselles de la Font de Loup, or the Ladies of the Fountain of the Wolves. They both have similar stats. I'm sure there's a difference somewhere. Matter of fact, there is a difference, and I'll talk about that in a second. The grapes for this wine and all of the wines from Font de Loup come from the northern part of a larger vineyard area called La Crau. La Crau is the source of many of the best CDPs out there. Other wines from La Crau are View Telegraph, Chateau Le Nerth, Chateau de Nayels, Domaine La Boutinière, and Guillaume Gonet. I'm sure I butchered a couple of those. But that's some pretty major players that Font de Loup is a part of. It's also a pretty large vineyard, as you can see. Okay, so let's get the stats for this wine. The 2019 Explicit Content CDP Rouge for 60 bucks. It's a collaboration with Chateau de la Font de Loup. It's a Chateau de Pop. The varieties are 
80% Grenache, 20% Syrah. It's 100% concrete fermentation and aging. The ABV is 14.5%. Production is 200 cases, about 2,400 bottles. So not a lot of this is made. So the big difference between this wine and their, their uh, the ladies that laid them as well, is that they age theirs in oak and this sees no oak. That's kind of the thing. So what I got told is that Jeremy is looking for sand. Uh, he's looking for, for grapes grown in sand because he, he feels that that, I think, helps express the grapes as pure. Also, sand really helps is great drainage. So you don't have wet feet and certain grapes don't like wet feet. Merlot likes wet feet, but a lot of grapes don't. And so he's looking for places with, with sandy soils and he wants no oak at all. He wants, the, he wants the grape to really express itself naturally or I guess in its natural state, which is cool. Anyway, so let's get into the wines. I am super excited to try all of these wines. I told Jeremy, no, no pressure on his, since I'm going to... So I text, so I didn't text him, but I, I, I sent him a message on Facebook. And I was like, hey man, I'm going to do your wine. Can you send me the story? Then I had to remind him a couple times. But anyway, he was like, do you like it? I'm like, no, I, I don't know. I like, no, I, it's like, I don't know. I haven't had it yet. I, I do this stuff first time. So I was like, so no pressure. I said, the reason I'm doing this on camera is because I've had his other wine, uh, which unfortunately he's not involved with anymore. It's a story and I'm not going to get into that. Um, but uh, I was like, you know, no pressure. You, you've already produced a pretty killer wine before or been involved with one. So I expect this one to be good too. I told him I was going to record this like a week ago. This is the 14th of November. I told him I was going to record on the 7th. So he's probably wondering about, he's probably wondering, because I haven't said anything to him. I've also not been on Facebook a lot uh, the last couple of months, and I don't plan to be on Facebook for quite a while uh, on a regular basis, and so I can concentrate on my studies. Anyway, he's probably wondering if I like, I, I keep reaching for that. So yeah, CDP White, uh, yeah, it, it is a unicorn wine, 7% is only made. So it's not something you're going to see very often. So that's another reason why I want to do this. And thanks to my friend Dan, who gave me this bottle and gave me this one too. Same, uh, same uh, distributor, importer, etc. cetera. Well, I was telling you what I was doing. So, I mean, uh, I didn't really have my holiday specials decided until about a month ago. I tried to decide these things in September so I can, you know, get things ready to go. And I am going to taste some white, red, white, red. That way I, can, I stay inside the region. Some of you people out there may, might be like, drink the whites first, then do the reds. But I'm a professional. We can, we can do this stuff. All right. So color wise, I mean, it's Chardonnay. So it has the typical Chardonnay color. It's a little bit lighter color. It's a medium color straw. Uh, there is such a green in here. And no, it's not because there's a green screen behind me because it's a blue screen, which I had to make sure I did that because none of these bottles have green on them. Well, the bottles are green, so they would be, all these bottles are green, so you'd see like blackness through them. But some of the other ones I've been doing have green on the label. Well, this has green on the label, doesn't it? Yeah, right there. That's green on the label. Anyway. So, you know, I'm going to say moderate plus, moderate aromatics. It smells like Chardonnay. I got some... Um, more yellow than green apple, but I got some apple on here, some pear, some uh, bit of orange, really faint on the orange. And then, uh, you know, I don't really get, I don't remember if, the, if I don't think it said anything about oak or it did. I don't remember what the oak was on this. So I'm going to scroll back as I'm smelling. Yeah. I mean, this is more just purity of fruit. I don't have really any oak on here, but let's see. Beaujolais like Blanc. Hand harvested, steel, yeah, no, yeah. Oh, yeah, so cellaring, I said cellaring no, no longer than three to four years. They mean don't hold on to it for more than three to four years. The red, I said cellaring seven to 12 years. I said seven to 12 months just now for the stats. Um, that's wrong. It meant, it, 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 depending on vintage, they, what they mean is, depending on the vintage, this can last seven to 12 years, and this one uh, can last uh, three to four years. And we are at... Nowhere near the three years yet. Well, we're near three years, but we're at two years. 
But yeah, no oak on this at all. So just a real pure fruit, exp fruit expression. A touch of white flour, but not a lot. Let's taste it. Tastes pretty good. I mean, it tastes like a Chardonnay. It's weird because, not weird, it's kind of cool, weird, whatever, because I don't really drink Beaujolais white very often. So I don't know what to make of it. I, I don't really have a, a baseline. It tastes like Chardonnay. It tastes more like Burgundy, you know, it tastes kind of like Burgundy. It also kind of tastes like Oregon Chardonnay. I mean, it's definitely a cooler climate Chardonnay. It's not like California, necessarily Napa Valley, but this could also be like a Sonoma. It, it, for as of right now, it doesn't, it doesn't scream old or new world to me. If I was pressed to guess, I would probably say old world on it, just because it does seem to have that, that, um, cool climate stuff. The lack of oak would have me a little confused just because no oak, Chardonnay, cool climate, Chardonnay. I'm like, okay, now we're talking like Chablis and it doesn't really come across as Chablis. I don't really have this, um, I don't really have this uh, flinty mineral out, minerality type of thing. Or a lot of times with, Char with uh, Chablis, I'll get like that margarita mix type of thing, that lime, lemon lime thing. This is more just like pure fruit. So I might think this might be like a um, a Puy, uh, Fousse type of thing, a little bit farther south in the, in the Burgundy and maybe all old oak or neutral oak or maybe all concrete. I mean, it tastes good. Uh, as, as regular viewers of the show know, Chardonnay is not my go-to when it comes to white wines, but I enjoy good Chardonnay. And this is a good Chardonnay. I mean, it's under 20 bucks from Beaujolais. Like, first of all, that's the cool factor right there. I forgot what the, forgot the stats are, but it's like, maybe I'll put it in a lower third, what percentage of wine is, is white from Beaujolais, but it's kind of like this. It's like 10% or less, I think. It's just pure fruit. It's a little bit tart on the fruit. It's that yellow, I'm sorry, green apple, peach, orange, a little bit of white flour going on there. Super easy to drink. It's got a little bit of brightness to it, a little bit of acidity to it. My mouth is watering. I'm going to assume this is you know, in that 3.5, maybe lower on the pH, probably acid is probably closer to like six, <clears throat> not quite, you know, seven or eight. I mean, that'd be really acidic, but probably closer to six. Just, you know, pure expression of fruit. All right, let's get into the, uh, the Beaujolais, the, the Moulin of Vent. So Morgan and Moulin of Vent are my two favorite crews when it comes to Beaujolais. I mean, I like all the, all the crews. Fleury is really cool because it is very pretty, like a flower. I don't get to drink a lot of the other cruise often, but Moulin Avant and Morgan are great. And having been able to go to Moulin Avant uh, in 17 was awesome. So yeah, this is more of the typical Christmas in a glass type of thing. So I get lots of spice. You know what I get? It's really weird. I've never had this before. I don't think ever in a red wine. I swear I smelled mustard, like mustard seed. I don't know. But I definitely get the spice. I get the clove, cinnamon, nutmeg, you get lots of sim, like red hot. A lot of that. Earthiness. Dried red fruit. I don't get any specific fruit right now, but it's a, a red fruit. It's in a drier nature. It is fairly light aromatically. It's not as aromatic as, I'm ex as I would expect from a Cru Beaujolais. I'd say a little bit of tar, not quite. But, you know, it's more non-fruit to me than fruit. Let's taste it. That's weird. The mustard still comes through. I love mustard, by the way. But it's, I get this dried cranberry, dried raspberry, dried blackberry. But I also get this like barbecue sauce type of thing. Not, not necessarily that there's volatile acidity, you know, there's vinegar. But I get this kind of a barbecue sauce type of thing. Or barbecue like meat, smoked meat, or maybe not smoked meat, but the barbecue meat flavor along with the the cinnamon clove, really kind of the red hot, the cinnamon clove, not quite the nutmeg on the palate. I get some violets, some red flowers. I get this. It is, there's a spice I can't describe, but but it's pretty prominent in, in the palate and also retroactively on the nose. It's like, you know, going into a spice shop. You get like a, you know, get this, amalgamation of, of spices hitting your hitting your nose. It's not as powerful as I would expect from a Moulin Avant. 
However, I, I'm starting to feel the alcohol. 14.1. Okay, yeah. But it's it's I hate to use the word clean with a wine, but it's it's not it's not like an over the top, like it's not hitting you in your face with oak or anything like that. Anything like that. I like the wine. I was hoping for it to be a little bit more powerful because Moulin Avant and Morgan tend to be the power hitters in Cru Beaujolais. This, I would probably, if I was blinding it and I figured it was Beaujolais, I'd probably put it in some other crew, but it's very nice. I like it. I'm not going to say it's my favorite wine, but I do like it a lot. And I mean, it's under 20 bucks and it's super easy to drink and it's a perfect Thanksgiving wine. I mean, both of these are great for Thanksgiving. All right, let's get into the Moulin, some of the Moulin. Let's get into the White Chateau of Pop. Now, first of all, it's kind of golden in color. So, I mean, it's not old, right? 19, it's only three years old. But I'm going to guess, you know, the, the probably the Roussan, because Roussan tends to give me this color a lot. Marsan Roussan tends to have this more yellowish color. Um, so I'm sure that's probably where it's coming from. Grenache Blanc should be pretty light, and I don't know what Claret does to the color, but I've had Marsan Roussan blends before from the Rhone, and they tend to have this kind of color. Oh, wow, it's really aromatic. So, it's a combination of a lot of things. In some ways, I kind of feel like I walked into a spa that's got vanilla candles, vanilla lavender candles burning. But it's really more the fruit, not the vanilla necessarily, but it's, it's, it's very rich on the fruit. It's very um, peach cobbler-like with melon, with cantaloupe. <sniffs> yeah, it's like a peach cobbler. Absolutely. The orange in there, some cantaloupe, some brown sugar. What did they do to this wine? I don't remember. Yeah, they're using barrels. It takes a while to get to the stats. Yeah, 100% new barrel. That's why. 100% new oak for 10 months. So, yeah, you're getting the spices from the barrels. Yeah. Because I'm getting kind of a brown sugar. I'm also getting some, not really cinnamon, but I get a little bit of clove. But, yeah, the peach clobber is, is the one thing that's just overwhelming. Let's just taste it. Holy whatever. Holy blank bat, man. Where do I start? So take that peach cobbler. The little whipped cream on it. Not a lot. Just a touch. Add some more brown sugar to it. Throw a little ginger. Touch. Because ginger is really overpowering. Um... Little 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 fire on there, a little little caramelization of, of the sugars. Put some vanilla ice cream next to it. Vanilla bean, like like Madagascar vanilla. Yeah. This thing's delicious. Whew. Okay. Um it didn't did it have the it didn't have you know what I didn't do the ABV on there, did I? It is. I think it's kind of a big boy. 14.5, it sure is. Yeah. Um, this is this is a full-bodied wine. This is not shy. It's 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 it, it came to party. It wants to be the star of the show. Like it's gonna go, hey man, I know everybody likes red Chateauneuf, but I, I'm gonna steal the show. It's like Tina Turner walked into the room, dude, and she, and, and she just like crushed everybody. I mean, yeah, powerful, elegant, you know, just full of life and vibrancy. Just, I mean, yeah, I mean, Tina Turner is kind of a, kind of a good, a good analogy for me. You know, I like to do music analogies, so. Some spice in there. Yeah. So, so if you're thinking about this for Thanksgiving, for sure the turkey will go great with it. And the stuffing, especially the stuffing, I think it'll be a great pairing with that. Um, 
The cranberry sauce probably not so great with with the white wine, but you've got you've got enough of the other stuff going. If you, I mean, if you have like a green bean casserole type of thing, yeah, green bean casserole or any type of casserole thing. Uh, I don't get a ton of mushroom necessarily on here, but if you have like a mushroom sauce doing this, I think that would be fantastic with this. You know, I hate mushrooms, but you know, but I can see this with a mushroom sauce. Like if you do like a chicken breast type of thing with mushroom sauce, potatoes, some like some like spring like Italian potatoes, yeah, that is super good. All right, the one the one I'm really waiting to try. All right, Jeremy, moment of truth. All right, so color, uh, we've got a medium minus concentration of color, mostly from this is this is mostly was it mostly Grenache or Syrah? I thought it was mostly Syrah. I thought it was 80 20 Syrah Grenache. Let's see here. Oh, it is Grenache. Okay. Was like, man, it's pretty light for 80% Syrah. Uh, yeah, so 80 20 Grenache Syrah. So, yeah, the Grenache is definitely coming through as far as the translucency. Um, you've got that kind of uh, bright ruby color, not almost, almost a purplish thing, not quite. Um, but yeah, you've got this kind of almost an electric red, not electric pink like a Malbec does, but you got this vibrancy to the color. And I'm going to guess that a lot of that is because it is just all concrete. There's no, no, um, uh, no, uh, whatchamacallit, oak. So yes, yeah, let's, let's check it out. You know, medium plus on, on the aromatics, very youthful. Yeah, I'm doing the grid on this one, kind of. So it's it's purely red fruit. So you've got you've got raspberry, you've got a touch of cranberry, but it's more more raspberry than anything else. Touch of strawberry, but it's really raspberry. That's the dominant red red fruit. <clears throat> it's ripe, it's fresh. It's almost <clears throat> raspberry candy, like hard shell candy type of thing. But then you get some you get some like uh, some spice components in here. So it's um. It's not cinnamon. It's not cinnamon clove nutmeg because those are really the oak. Those are really the oak spices. But you do get a touch of something like that. It's more of a baking spice. There's a touch of smoke to it. Syrah coming through. A touch of meatiness to it. Syrah. I wouldn't say necessarily it has the iron or the blood that Syrah sometimes does. But we're on that. We're on that path. There's a touch of cinnamon to it. But if I was smelling this, I'd be like, man, it's, it's a spice component, but it's not oak spice. All right, let's taste it. Tastes good. Is it punk rock AF? Kind of, because it's no oak on this thing. Um, it's not shy. It's a little bit, it's a little bit lighter in style because it's not in your face with the flavors, but the alcohol is coming through. Um, this one still is, I think the boldest of, of all four wines, but it's got that pure, it really does have a purity of fruit. It's really got that raspberry, like really linear raspberry thing going on with some dry cranberry. So this is really, I mean, seriously, you throw that cranberry sauce on, on, on top of the turkey with the stuffing and you drink it with this, you, you, you game over. I mean, it's, it's super delicious. There's also this, like, it, it may sound bad how, how I'm going to describe it, but I feel like I went to the pool. There's like this, like the wet concrete, like the clean smell of it, not the chlorine smell of a pool, right? Just the clean, or just, or you're in a winery, and they just hose down the floor. So the floor is concrete and you get that wet concrete. It's like the petrichor type of thing, right? The, you know, the ionization from like when it's about to rain, you get that. It's more on the palate than the nose, but it's right there. What I like about it is it's, it's super, it's, it's, it's super like easy to drink. Even though like I, I, I can feel the alcohol, but it's still well contained. Like I know it's there. But because the wine is fairly light, it doesn't hit you over the head. This is a, I mean, it's a, you could drink this wine on its own. You could. But I think this is a really good balanced wine that you could throw with food. Of course, holiday fare would be great with this. 
turkey, ham for sure. Um, but you could also do something like, um, like you do like a, like a, a lighter steak, like a, like a filet or a sirloin or even a New York strip that you do like a simple, um, salt and pepper, or maybe do some, um, uh, herbs of Provence on it. Since Provence is kind of near Rome, um, herbs of Provence, everything like, uh, seasoned potatoes with it. Um, yeah, Italian style potatoes, honestly, but you can do something like that. Uh, you can do a pizza if you want to, because as I said, the acidity is there. You need, for pizza wine, pizza wine needs acidity. Um, you can't, I mean, yeah, you can do cab with, with pizza, but it really needs something that's bright to gives you extra lift to the pizza. That's why Sangiovese goes really well. And Italian wines, a lot of times in general, because they tend to have a higher acid, they go really well with pizza. Jeremy, you, you, you did well. Actually, I like this wine better than your last one. I think this was a more balanced and more polished wine. Polished not meaning it's oaked. Polished because it's it's really well made. So kudos to you know what your vision was for this wine and them executing it. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to say this real quick, just because I, I, I debated whether I would say it or not, and I'm going to say it because it's gone away. So if you've watched my show for a long, long time, you'll know that sometimes with Syrah and Pinot, I will get bug spray. This had it. It had it for like the briefest of seconds on the nose. It didn't have it on the palate necessarily, but it had it for a little bit and now it's completely gone. And the reason I mention this is that I'm trying to figure out what causes that. And speaking with Carol Mer Meredith's husband, I think it's David, um, it's a site specific thing. And he didn't tell me anything about soil wise, but he got it from certain certain vineyards in, in, in California, in Napa, uh, but other vineyards he doesn't get it from. And it's, it's, and it's really just not, it, it's more for Pinot than, than Syrah, but he gets it with Syrah too. Um, so I'm wondering if a sandy soil does that. So now that I have, now that I have a wine that I know is grown on almost purely sand, I guess, I can take a look at that a little bit more. But I will say this, usually those wines, it sticks around and it's like noticeable and I can't get, I can't get past it. This one, it was like, it was there for a second. I was like, oh, damn. But then it was, it was gone. So I was debating about saying this like off camera to Jeremy, but I really, I really feel like I have to say that. But again, the problem is when I use that term, it's a really bad term. And it's just how I interpret whatever that aroma is. And for most people, they don't get it that way. So it's just something in my brain, how it, how it, how it does things that I get it. It's probably pleasant for most other people. For me, it's now more of an incense type of thing and it's really delicious. I like it, Jeremy. Good job. All right. Well, that's it for this year's Thanksgiving uh, special. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and then tell your friends uh, and we'll see you next time. Damn it, Jeremy, out of your, out of your wine. I'll, I'll toast with this one. <laughs>